Well, good morning. Welcome to Parish Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day morning. As you can uh, see, this is a socially distanced service. We have uh, lots of folks who are ill, but it is such a delight to be able to see you. And uh, thank you for the privilege of uh, bringing us into your homes, those of you who are uh, watching via live stream. Uh, we gather on this day uh, with the great hope of the good news of the gospel. In uh, John chapter 1, we have this beautiful picture of the incarnation of Christ, uh, the fulfillment of every great promise of the Old Testament. Uh, there, John waxes eloquent, declaring, uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. and the sound of the horn make a joyful noise before the king the Lord.
scripture reading from 2 Timothy 3. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to God. now the reading of God's holy word as it's found in Psalm 19, starting at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins, let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. As we started our series in the Psalms, in Psalm 2, we heard of four vo voices. And then in last week in Psalm 19, if you were with us, we heard of the voice of creation. This morning we're going to look at the voice from God's Word, and then the psalmist and his voice as we look into the rest of this wonderful passage in Psalm 19. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing upon our time together. 
Father in heaven, the God of all creation, the one who has <clears throat> created and sustains all living things, you have revealed yourself primarily in your word. And we pray now as we look into it that you would show us wonderful things in it by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would open our eyes. Oh, Lord, to see the Lord Jesus, the Word made flesh, who came and dwelt with us. Oh, Lord, we look to you this morning to lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The importance of God's Word in the Christian life is essential. It is core to who we are as Christians, to show us how to live. Uh, Thomas Watson, in his book, Heaven Taken by Storm, he uh, speaks of an image of God's Word this way. Look upon, he says, the Word as a spiritual glass to dress yourselves by. It is a mirror for those who are blind. In mirrors, you see your face. In this glass, in this glass mirror, you see your and John Calvin says, The scriptures are like spectacles for weak or dimmed eyes, dimmed by sin, to see who the Lord is and all that He has done. The scriptures throughout uh, show us images of the Word of God as the rule, as a mirror, as a law, as wisdom, as a lamp. What it is showing us is the importance of the Word of God in the Christian life. It is essential. And we come now to Psalm 19, where it has shown us the theme of this song of the revelation of God. The revelation in verses 1 through 6 in the creation, and in verses 7 through 14 in His Word. What do we discover in Psalm 19? It's this because the scriptures reveal the Word as the one who who through Christ redeems us, then we, you and I, must desire to know His Word in order to know Him and live for Him day by day. But oftentimes, we struggle with this, don't we? In the reading, in the hearing, and in the living, right? We get distracted by all kinds of things, primarily the pleasures of sin, and our delight in the law of the Lord wanes, or even seemingly at times is non-existent. So the question we're asking of Psalm 19 is this, why should we, you and I, desire to know the Lord through His Word? Two things. First, the reasons that the psalmist gives us, David gives us in 7 through 10, to know the Lord through His perfect Word. And then the response, David's response in verses 11 through 14 of prayer to know the Lord of this perfect word. First, he gives the description as a reason, the, the descriptions for the word. And he shows in these descriptions of the word both the names of the word of the Lord and the effects that they have the effects that they have in the life of the Christian. You notice here, he goes from saying the, 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 the God of creation in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God in a general sense, to Lord here in verse 7 with anticipation. Last week we were waiting on verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord. This is not a distant deity. This is Yahweh, the covenant Lord, the covenant-keeping Lord, who is His Lord, as we'll see. He calls Him His Lord, my rock and my redeemer in verse 14. But what are the names that we see of the word of the Lord? We see six different names, the law of the Lord, the testimonies of the Lord, the precepts, the commands in verse 8, and in verse 9, the fear of the Lord and the rules of the Lord. All of these are building upon itself throughout these three verses. 
It's heightening its sense of importance for the people of God. They're essential. They're not an option for the Christian. We see this in Psalm 119, where all of that one psalm, which is the longest psalm in the entire Psalter, is devoted to the word of the Lord, shaping the Christian's life. And what are the descriptions? Don't you love these descriptions? I'm going to run through them very quickly. I could spend a whole sermon just on these three verses, but I won't. (laughs) The, The perfect word. This is the complete word of the Lord. There's no Uh, corruption. There's no deficiency. There's nothing lacking in this word. It is complete, perfect, because it comes from a God who is perfect. It's showing and reflecting the very perfections of the God of this word. Secondly, the testimonies of the Lord are sure. They're trustworthy. You can take these to the bank and cash them in. They are trustworthy and true. The precepts and the commands of the Lord, he says in verse 8, are right and they are pure. The purity, the ethical purity of the very word of the Lord, they're clear to us and and pure and holy. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean and the rules of the Lord are true. I don't know about you, but when, when there is laws put on us, right, or rules put on us that are arbitrary and hard to uh, understand why we have to follow these rules, right, we get frustrated, we get disgruntled. But when we know that the words uh, and laws and rules are not arbitrary, but intentionally purposeful, and from a good person, right, from a good God. We desire to keep them. We desire to live by them. Uh, 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 Our own Westminster uh, Confession and Catechisms, question four of the larger catechism, says this, how doth it appear that the Scriptures are the Word of God? How do we know that they are the Word of God? Well, look at Scripture itself. It says, the Scriptures manifest themselves to be the very Word of God. Why? By their majesty and purity, by the consent of all the parts, by the scope of the whole, which is given all glory to God, by the light and the power to convince and convert the sinners and to comfort and build up believers unto salvation. But the Spirit of God, bearing witness by and with the Scriptures in the heart of man, is able alone to fully persuade it that they are the very word of God. Of God. When we, are, when we are convinced that these rules and laws and, and, and promises are sure and true, we see how essential they are in the life of the believer. And that's the effects that we see here on us. What do we see? Well, in verse 7, they're reviving the soul, they're restoring, renewing. They're building up. They're making wise the simple. They bring wisdom into our lives to show us what to do and when to do it and how to do it. In verse 8, they rejoice the heart and they enlighten the eyes. These are good things for the Christian. They're the hope, the comfort that we need. There is no better time than in our very time of need when we are at at the side of a a, a person passing away. What do they want to know? They want to know the comfort of the Word of God. Oftentimes, Psalm 23, which we'll get to next time. That the Lord is our shepherd. He is our God, our Lord, our Savior. They are the way that we are to live. It enlightens our path. Psalm 119.105, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It exposes the darkness and shows us the path of righteousness. In verse 9, they endure forever and they're righteous all together. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Praise the Lord for that. 
the effects of this word in the life of the Christian is essential. The problem is twofold. One, we were created dependent upon this word. And so the general revelation around us is not sufficient to show us the way of life. We have to have the word of God. But even more so, we're in a fallen state. We're in a sinful state where our minds are corrupt and our hearts are tainted with sin. And we're in desperate need of the words of life. And that's why the psalmist moves from just describing the word to then delighting in it. He says in verse 10, more to be desired, more to be delighted in than gold. And not just any type of gold, not just a few carats of gold, but fine, refined gold, right? Refined in the furnace of the fires, right? And he also says it's sweeter, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. He uses two images here, that gold that is refined in the, the flowers that are, fires that are more valuable, right, than any other <laughs> precious metal. He's saying the Word of God is not even comparable. It is way more valuable to the Christian, to the man or woman of God. And it's much sweeter. It's much sweeter than the, the, the finest of honey, right? The, the honey that's coming, dripping from the honeycomb. And don't you just, uh, as we look forward to lunch, to think about how sweet honey is, to get that homemade biscuit and put that nice real butter on top and then sprinkle that drizzle that honey on top there's nothing better than the sweetness of honey and, and David says oh yes there is it's the sweetness of the word of God isn't it something when somebody knows that you are going through something and they text you or they write you a card and, and they come alongside and put their arm around you Yes, maybe not during the pandemic time, but, but they put your arm around you and they give you the word of life. It is the comfort that revives your soul. It is sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. That's why the, the psalmist in Psalm 119, 97 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I find my life in the pages of this word because it tells me not just of rules and regulations. It tells me of the way of life through the Savior, Jesus Christ. It gives me the path of life. It shows me on how to live and what to do. That's why I delight in it, because it shows me the God of this word. He says in Psalm 119, 13 through 16, with my lips, I declare all the rules of my mouth. In the way of my testimonies, I delight as much in all, as, as much in, in all riches. I meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Is that your prayer? Can you say that about your life? That you delight in the law of the Lord? the word, from Genesis to Revelation. And does your life show that? And the way that you spend time in it, and the way that you devote it to memory, and the way that you, you, you speak it, it's, it's the words that come out of your mouth because it's in your life. It's in your heart. That's the desire of David as he responds now from delighting to a response of prayer. He says here, in verse 11 and 12. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. He responds with a response beginning of prayer. First, it's to keep him from sin. And the secondly, it's to, to please him, to please the Lord. You remember back in verse 5 and 6, it spoke of the Son and the beams of the sun, and how nothing is hidden from its heat. Nothing is exposed from, nothing is, is left unexposed from the heat of the sun. It's the same manner with the Word of God. In verses 7 through 9, it's as if nothing is hidden from the, the heat of the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, 
uh, verses 12 and 13 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow. And listen to this. This really hit me this week. Discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Haven't you been in a situation where the Word of God just cuts right through the middle of something? <laughs> it cuts through all the fray. It cuts through all the, the sin that's, that's, that's clouding our judgment, right? And the Word just cuts right through it like a sword. You think of uh, Acts chapter 2 when Peter is, is proclaiming that wonderful Pentecost sermon. And you see how the Word of God pierces the hearts of the people as he says this. Now when they heard, this is verse 37, this they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? The double-edged sword comes and pierces through. Nothing is hidden from the light of the very word of life. He says here that we see two things in verse 11. Moreover is your servant warned. He refers to himself as the servant of the Lord. He's warned, warned of, about the dangers of going against or transgressing the laws of God. Warnings in Scripture are so important for us. It keeps us in the way. It, 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 it wakes us up to the fact of how we have allowed sin to entangle our feet. But there's also rewards in the Word of God, in obedience to the Word of God. He says, there is in keeping them, there is great reward. Not just a little reward, but great reward. You see, in, in the very beginning, Adam was promised life, everlasting life, if he obeyed the word of the Lord to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But as we know, he, he transgressed that law and ate. But the psalmist says there's great reward when we keep this word. The problem is we are prone to wander. Just like the hymnist says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We are prone to go our own way. That's why we need the word of God. And that's why the psalmist in verse 12 says, who can discern my errors? Who can discern the ways that I go astray? And my heart is so deceitful and desperately wicked as Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, who can know it? That's why we need the Word of God that discerns the intentions of the heart. It's the Word that shows us our imperfections. Richard Belcher, in his uh, wonderful book on Messiah and the Psalms, says this, The perfection of the law brings to light the imperfections of the psalmist here. Anytime we sit under or read the Word of God and place it place ourselves under the Word of God, it exposes our hearts. It shows us where we have gone astray, and it leads us in the path everlasting. He says, declare me innocent from hidden or secret sins, secret faults, those sins that we hide away as our bosom sins. He also says in verse 13, keep back your servant also from presumptuous or arrogant, or just going headlong into sin. I'm just going to go and indulge my flesh in this sin. He says, let them not have dominion over me. Del Ralph Davis in his commentary shows the, the pattern. He says, so we find a pattern here that moves from hidden faults in verse 12 to arrogant sins in verse 13 uh, the first part, and then to decisive apostasy. You think, oh, I, I'll get away with this little sin. We deceive ourselves if that's the truth. If we keep indulging our sin, it will lead us down a path of destruction, is what the psalmist is saying here. He's saying, keep me back. He's responding in earnest prayer 
Lord, keep me back from all of these sins. And when you do that, then I will be blameless and innocent from great transgression. I am dependent upon you. We have to ask the question, what has rule or dominion over your life? Does King Jesus have his rule and his word have his way in your life? Or is sin reigning and controlling you? That's why the psalmist here prays, O oh Lord, use your word and keep me from all kinds of sins. That's why we need the instrument, the, the sharp instrument of this double-edged sword to be used by the Spirit of God in our lives. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, our scripture reading, that all of scripture, not just the parts that we like, <laughs> but all Scripture is able to teach us and reprove us and correct us and to train us in righteousness that we, you and I, men and women, boys and girls of the Lord may be competent, or another way to say it, complete, equipped for every good work fully qualified by the Word and Spirit for every good work. That's why the psalmist would pray in Psalm 119, verse 18, Open my eyes, Lord, that I may behold wondrous things in your law. I am desperate for your Word, and I am desperate for your Spirit to lead me into the truth and paths of righteousness. That's why he ends his prayer with verse 14. He prays to please the Lord. He wants his life to rather than going into the way of apostasy and abandoning the faith, to go in the way of righteousness and to be pleasing in his sight. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, O Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. He desires, just like the heavens declare the glory of God, He desires His life to declare the glory of God, both in His speech and His mouth and in the intentions and the deep recesses of His heart before the Lord. All His meditations, all His mutterings and, and thinkings, all His doings to be to the glory of God. That's why He would pray in Psalm 51, after he is exposed in his sin, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Because I know out of the heart, Jesus says, the mouth speaks. It's a heart problem that has to change. And that's why he looks to the Lord and not himself to be able to change himself. He looks to the Lord Yahweh, the covenant Lord, who is his rock, my rock. He's his personal Lord and he's his personal refuge. As Psalm 18 verses 1 through 3 says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He's our rock of refuge, and He is our Redeemer. The one who has come to buy us back from the slave master of our own sins, the dominion of our sin. He has redeemed us by His precious blood. The Word who was with God in the very beginning, who created the world, is the Word that took on flesh to dwell among us. And not just to dwell among us, but to put himself under the law to keep it perfect. He's the perfect word and the perfect lamb of God to lay down his life for his people and to make a way as our great high priest, as uh, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4 continues in verse 14, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize 
with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He's perfect. Let us then with confidence, just like David did here in this psalm, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in our, in, and help in our time of need. You see how essential the Word of God is in our lives. And, and the psalmist lays out these reasons in his descriptions and, and effects in our lives. It is our necessary food. As Deuteronomy 8.3 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of and so we can pray just along with David, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, may you make this word, this perfect word, the way of my life, so that it is pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ alone. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we thank you for Psalm 19. It's so full. It's so full of your word. It's so full of how the psalmist delights in your word. But Lord, we know how far short we fall and how little we desire to know your word, to know you. And so Lord, we come confessing. We come confessing that we know our transgressions and our sins are ever before us. Against you, you only, have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Behold, we were brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did our mothers conceive us. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Purge us with hyssop and we shall be clean. Wash us and we shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face from our sins and blot out our iniquities. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Hear this assurance of pardon. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Dear ones, this is the promise of God. This is the word of the Lord. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self control upright in godly lives in this present age. And so we await our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Please stand.
up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God our Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore we praise you, shining God, and we join our voices with the angels and the archangels and the whole company of heaven in this hymn of eternal praise. from the mouth of God. And now, sitting with his disciples, he reminds them again as they partake of this final Passover meal. It is the word of the living God fulfilled before their very eyes and now made manifest in these uh, feeble signs of ordinary bread and ordinary wine. If the testimony of your life is that you have trusted Christ and Christ alone and his provision as the word of life then run to this table. If you have never trusted Christ as your savior, I would love to pray with you this morning. I'll be out in the lobby and uh, I would be delighted to, uh, uh, to introduce you to the hope of redemption in Christ Jesus the savior. If you have anything else that you'd like to pray about, I'll be out there as well. These, uh, dear brothers and sisters, are the signs and seals of this grace. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your table, we do so with joy and thanksgiving. Uh, we pray that you would build us up in faith and give us a hunger for the word of life. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. My heart is filled with thankfulness to Him who bore my pain. Full from the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again. Oh gosh, my curse of sinfulness clothed me with His and wrote his love righteousness with power upon my heart is filled with thankfulness to him who walks this who floods my weakness as with strength cause as Whose every promise is enough for every step shows that love in your
gives us the great privilege of coming before his throne of grace. Let's now pray. O oh Lord, we give thanks to you. We call upon your name. That we will make known all your deeds among the peoples. We will sing to you in psalms and hymns, extolling all your wondrous works. We seek you, O oh Lord. We seek you and your strength. We seek your face forevermore. Uh, for you are the Lord our God, and your judgments are in all the earth. You have remembered your covenant forever, the word which you commanded for a thousand generations. You remember us, and you remember your promises to us. Therefore, we now approach your throne with thanksgiving and hope. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. We cry out to you, Lord, for comfort for Betty Jane Adams uh, following the loss of her beloved husband, Jay. And uh, we uh, likewise pray uh, for the, the, the great, great loss uh, that, uh, that the Christian world has experienced uh, in uh, Jay Adams' uh, passing. Uh, Lord, give us comfort 
and uh, show us in his life and in his legacy uh, the great joy of our redemption. We pray, Lord, uh, for healing for Brandon and Tom, uh, for Jason, Teresa, Pam, Robert, uh, Rich, Steve, uh, for Bonnie's mother and for Stephanie's father. For all of those who are uh, traveling uh, for the Thanksgiving holidays, we pray that you would give them safe journeying and bring them back to us safely, we pray. We pray, too, for Mike and Stephanie Fenema and Rob and Elizabeth Thacker as they embark on a new aspect of their ministries. Lord, uh, surround them uh, with the great hope of the good news. We praise you, Lord, uh, for the surgery date that has been set uh, for Alex, the Soyster's granddaughter. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to use the testimony of this remarkable family for your glory and that you would bring quick and full healing to Alex. Uh, Lord, we pray for all of those who are unemployed and underemployed and ask you to provide for them and enable us to be uh, side by side with them as they walk in this journey. Uh, we pray too for all of those who have suffered losses in the course of the last year and are facing this holiday season without someone that they love. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would give them the hope of eternal life and the promises of heaven. The allotment of our inheritance that was invested upon us while we were still bound and captive to our sin. But by the finished work of Jesus, uh, we were brought back from the slave market of sin. Our shackles were broken, our chains were shattered, and we were set free. No longer as slaves, but now as adopted sons and daughters. And so by the authority that was yours long ago, is yours even now, and will be yours unto ages of ages, uh, we come claiming the kingdom prerogative, praying just as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
receive now this benediction from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. To Christ who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father unto him be glory and dominion. Just a couple of quick reminders. First, uh, all of your Operation Christmas Child uh, Samaritan's Purse boxes need to be back here today or tomorrow. So if you forgot it today, got to get it here tomorrow so that we can make sure that they arrive to children around the world uh, before Christmas. Uh, secondly, uh, I need for all of you just to stay well, okay? Stay well. And third, have a blessed Thanksgiving. God bless.